Hello and welcome to GameSack. Man, I love that new games are still being released for these ancient obsolete consoles. And by new games, I mean games that were released after the console stopped being officially supported. Anyway, I'll get my dumb face off the screen so we can just get right into the games. First up is Astros. Wait, Astros on the Genesis from Neophid. It came out in 2023. This is basically a prequel to Demons of Astroborg, which was featured in a previous New Games for Old Consoles episode. Okay, before we get too far into this, I just want to say that this game has 120 mega power. See, it even says it right on the box. You choose one of three players to control, and that control is very smooth. The game feels great. You have a base camp which expands throughout your adventure. From there, you go to a place on the map which is basically going to be a dungeon. Here, you want to grab all of the loot and defeat the boss so you can get an orb. If you die, you lose some items and money, but you need to mash the A button to lose less of it, I guess? This is one of the three minor complaints I have about the game. This mechanic doesn't serve any purpose, and having to mash the button is just annoying. Anyway, you start back at your camp, and you can go back to the same dungeon, but now it's completely rearranged for basically no reason whatsoever. Yep, this game is a rogue light. What a dumb name for a genre. Can't we just call it a roguevania? Sometimes you'll encounter and rescue others. They appear back at your base camp and offer shops with various services, like selling stuff, forging weapons, or dealing with magic. Be careful about buying some of the stuff because it only lasts for one life, and honestly, it's not worth your money at all. However, some upgrades are permanent, like if you find a fairy and have 100 coins to fork over for a slightly longer life bar. Or if you have enough orbs, you can break through the doors in your camp and get a new ability, like running by double tapping right as it says here. It also works in the left direction, but you need to be smart like me to figure that out. The game doesn't tell you. You can switch to the other two characters at base camp, and they feature ranged attacks compared to the sword guy. They're definitely cool and all, but I found the game more difficult when playing as them. Supposedly, the game's supposed to be a bit easier with the ranged attacks. No matter what though, some enemies are gonna wreck you. Like this guy who puts you in his bag. There is no way to escape that I know of. I mean, there probably is, but how to do it is lost on me. When you get to a boss, you can also spend some money to unlock a gate. That way you can warp right to them from the beginning of the level no matter how it's arranged, which is much appreciated. Speaking of the bosses, this game can be pretty damn tough. However, don't forget that you're invincible while dashing, just like Alien Soldier. This will help a ton. I like the circus boss here where you have to complete challenges successfully between attacking them. If you do well, the crowd throws you life or money. If you don't, they throw tomatoes at you which can hurt you. The graphics are pretty nice and well drawn, from the backgrounds to all of the different sprites. I like the shadow and highlight usage, like the spotlight here in the circus boss. The music is outstanding, it kind of reminds me of Gauntlet 4. Well, except for the circus music, that's not outstanding. I mean, it's not awful, it's just, you know, circus music. You can buy this as a Genesis ROM for about 20 US dollars or a physical edition, which also lets you download the ROM. You can also get it for around that on other platforms like the Switch, Steam, or whatnot. The physical Genesis game will cost you about $100 after shipping to the US. For that, you get an excellent feeling clamshell case, though the hang tab on mine is extremely loose. You also get reversible artwork, which is a big thing these days. Inside the box, you have a nice color instruction manual. There are also some stickers if you're into that. And then there's a resealable plastic baggie which has some cards and more stickers. The cartridge both looks and feels great. Is the cartridge beveled? Let's see. What the hell? That's right, there was literally nothing inside of my cartridge. Fortunately, the purchase comes with a digital download that you can play using a flash card, so that's what I did for this review. Ah oh well, nobody's perfect, so I contacted Neofit and they arranged to have another cartridge sent out. While it hasn't arrived yet, since it's coming from across the pond, judging by their previous game, Demons of Astroborg, it's safe to assume that the cartridge PCB for this game will also be beveled, so it won't damage your Genesis in any way. Overall, the game is extremely well made and I do recommend it to most people. So, what are my other two minor complaints I have with this game? Well, it's just that with the randomness of the roguevania genre, it often feels that I'm not making any progress as powering yourself up is often the luck of the draw. And losing a bunch of stuff when you die can sometimes make it feel like I'm regressing rather than progressing. Lastly, there's only one save slot. Why? 
Despite all this, I usually want to try again, but not to the point where I care about finishing the game. The Sega Genesis seems to be far and away the most popular platform to release new games on, at least the meatiest games, not that I'm complaining. But these next three games are not on a Sega platform, though no, one of them does have a Sega version. Anyway, let's get back to the games. Here's Vax Collection from Mindwreck for the TurboGrafx Super CD or Turbo Duo and of course any of the PC Engine counterparts. This comes on two CDs and the first CD has four games selectable at this menu. First up is Vax. Basically, you play as Dr. Fauci who runs around on a little screen. You need to run over the colored spots and give them the jab so that they flash black. No, I'm kidding. That's not actually what's happening here. I'm just making fun of the name Vax. You just need to run over the colored spots so that they change color. While doing this, you also need to avoid the enemies which are bouncing around the screen like a bunch of DVD player logos. Once all of the spots are flashing black, you advance to the next level. If you touch an enemy, well, it's death for you. Eventually, you'll need to run over the spots multiple times to change them, kind of like Qbert's upper levels in a way. Sometimes there's a one-up that you can get. Even more rare is the pentagram, which sends a blue flame across the screen, getting rid of all the enemies. Next is Slope Dope. You're on skis and you have to navigate downwards between the trees. You gotta be careful not to pull a Seni Bono on this one. There's a timer running and if you steer, you slow down. Once the timer runs out, you get judged on your final distance. The goal of the game is to get as much distance as possible in the time allotted. That's it. Next up is Wave of Thunder. This is kind of like Slope Dope except that you're in a boat. You propel upwards in your boat, avoiding obstacles. You can jump when the jump icon is flashing at the bottom of the screen. Once you run into anything, you die a horrible, very painful death and you're measured on your distance. The goal is, you guessed it, to get as much distance as you can. Last up we have Zars Vegion Vigion? I don't know, I can't read the word on the bottom here. According to the manual, it's Zars Altion. Anyway, this is basically Yar's Revenge. I don't remember how to play Yar's Revenge, but this is exactly it. Yet somehow less flashy than the Atari 2600 game as the digital column doesn't color cycle or anything. The entire disc is basically simple Atari-like games for your turbo graphics, but with plenty of good music that plays on top of everything. The second CD is Implode Remastered, which contains three games. First up is Implode, which is a puzzle game. You have a cursor and you press the button to disappear three or more blocks of the same color. Disappear enough of them and you beat the level. The music is pretty good, though the bottom row of colors might be clipped off the edge of your TV if you play on a CRT as this game doesn't take overscan into account. Next is Hump Ball. This is basically side view Pong or maybe if Pong were a volleyball game instead of tennis. You can jump. This one didn't keep my interest for very long. Lastly, we have Crash. This is like the old Sega arcade game called Head On, where you drive a car around changing lanes trying to collect all of the dots. Except this one is a lot faster and far more difficult right from the first level. The collection comes in a two disc jewel case with color artwork. You have to very carefully pry this part open to gain access to the other CD. The manual is thin, in color, and provides all of the information that you need for each game, which isn't much. If you like simple games, or maybe your kids do, then this collection might be for you. Here's Xeno Crisis for the Nintendo 64, released by Bitmap Bureau in 2023. This continues their goal of releasing it for just about every console capable of it, I think. It's kind of amazing to see a brand new physically released game on the platform. 
This twin stick overhead run and gun has been in most of these new games for old consoles episodes on various platforms. And this version is more or less the same as those. Run around rooms that appear in a random order, shoot aliens, save trapped hostages, collect dog tags and weapons, and fight bosses. You can upgrade yourself between the stages with all of the dog tags that you've collected, and things here can be pretty expensive, but you absolutely need all of the upgrades that you can get. Control-wise, you can move with either the analog stick or the D-pad. The four C buttons shoot in the direction that you press them. There are a few other control options as well. I do like how the Z trigger does your roll with the default control scheme. It's just hard for me to remember to do it. This could have been four player simultaneous, but it isn't. I imagine that would have probably required a bit too much cash to create two new characters and everything that goes with them. But you can still play with a friend if you want. And the game is still crazy hard. As always, the game becomes more enjoyable with the cheat mode, but try not to go too crazy with it. Maybe start by using it as a level select after you lose all of your continues. Hell, at least there is a cheat mode. The graphics feel basically just like the Genesis version. The only thing that Nintendo 64 is really doing here is preventing some flicker on this boss. There might be a bit more color here and there, but it's certainly not obvious. I'm kind of disappointed that it's not grainy, blurry, and full of fog. I mean, those qualities are what makes the Nintendo 64 the Nintendo 64. Nobody wants sharp graphics that they can see on this console. The music by Savage Regime is still awesome here, and you'll swear that someone installed a Genesis sound chip into your Nintendo 64. This one features all of the extra voices that the other high memory versions of the game have, which is nice. The voices aren't quite as crisp as, say, the Dreamcast version, but they still sound great. Dispatch a squad of our finest marines. You can buy this as a downloadable ROM or a physical edition. The physical package for this one is incredible. The box feels like the same cardstock used on official releases, and even it looks like it could be an official game released back in the day. Opening up the box, things are stored in a familiar manner as well. You get a large color manual, and there's even a bit of British humor here and there. The cartridge itself feels weighty and absolutely perfect, very authentic. Opening it up, it even has those same metal shielding plates that the official carts do. And naturally, the PCB is beveled. There's an upcoming release of this one for the Super NES, and I hope to show that one next time I do one of these episodes. I wonder how the sound will be in that one. It had better be muffled and full of reverb, or there's gonna be riots. Either way, that one's going to be super interesting to look at. Here's Dino Force for the Turbo Graphics 16 and PC Engine from PCE Works. This was an actual game that was being developed in Japan for the console by Athena back in 1993. However, it was canceled and never released until now. Well, 2022 anyway. The code was cleaned up and here we have it. This is a horizontal shooter and kind of a weird one at that. I've looked at the manual and I'm still not 100% sure how it works, but I do believe I have a good idea. At certain points, you'll be granted access to new weapons. You press and hold the one button to pause the game to select your weapons. This is pretty odd. You can have many different weapons at once. Now it seems that the faster you kill the enemies when they appear on the screen, the higher percentage you get when they die, thus the more the power number builds up. I think you get your weapons when that number gets to a certain point, but I always seem to get them at the same point in the stage each time I played it, so I don't know. Like I said, this is a weird one. The different weapons do different things, of course, and there are 25 of them in total if you can find them all. I like this one, which creates a ghost ship that the enemy shoot at instead of you. It's actually pretty helpful. Your lives are represented by these little dashes, and naturally when you die, the weapon that you were using goes away. You respawn right where you died, which is nice, but make no mistake, this game is pretty tough. Except for the first boss here, he is ridiculously easy. You don't even need to move if you just park yourself right here. There are no continues at all. I found a cheat code to start with 10 lives and you're gonna need it. Press two, then one, then select at the title screen before you begin your game. Now I know what you're thinking and I'm certainly thinking it too. This game is called Dino Force. Where the hell are the dinosaurs? Well, you see that eyeball bobbing up and down there? That's probably a dinosaur eyeball. At least I think it's an eyeball. 
The graphics are nice for a hue card game with good color. A little parallax scrolling would have been nice, but sadly, that's not common on the platform. The music is pretty good with some catchy tunes, and yes, there's even a sound test you can get with the cheat code. You can buy the physical version, or you can download the ROM for free. The packaging is incredible, which is no surprise coming from PC Works. The game comes in both PC Engine and TurboGrafx-16 variants, as each console locks the other out internally, so make sure you choose wisely. The manual is in black and white, which matches the manuals for the console at the time. Yeah, color might have been nice, but hey, it's authentic. The PC Engine manual is all in Japanese, but it comes with an English insert so you're not left out. There's a piece of foam protecting the card, as well as a nice plastic sleeve for the Hue card. The Hue cards themselves are perfection. You'd never know these weren't made back during the system's life. It's a far cry from the previous attempts at making Hue cards. Overall, this is definitely not the best shooter on the system, but it's also not the worst. There's some fun to be had here, especially if you want to put in the time to learning it and hate the concept of continues. Okay, I've got two more games to show you, and the first one is actually a follow-up of the other. The first one actually left me wanting more. This is Life on Mars for the Genesis from Kai Software, which was released in 2022. This is a side-scrolling Metroidvania type of game. Kind of a dollar store in Metroid, actually, but that's not a bad thing. Your giant ship approaches Mars to check on the colony of people that Earth lost contact with two years ago. The people here were investigating some underground water that they found on the planet. Upon arrival, you take a ship to investigate all by yourself. Once you get down to the surface, you go ahead and enter the colony structure. All of a sudden, the worker robots are attacking you. Fortunately, you can shoot back. And you can shoot in all of the directions except for the downward ones. Naturally, you can also jump, but these two things are really all you can do at the beginning. At first, it takes a ton of shots to defeat the worker robots. Fortunately, each and every time you defeat an enemy, it drops a little thing called a cell. The cell always does two things, give you a little bit of life back and also a little bit of the game's currency. As you go through the game, you'll find kiosks that you can save at. You'll also find and equip new abilities like a couple of different sub-weapons, a double jump, and a run feature. You'll even find icons that increase the limit of your life and energy. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. The energy governs how much you can fire your weapons. When the bar bottoms out, you can't fire until it refills a bit. Fortunately, it doesn't take long to fill enough for you to fire again. With the cells, you can upgrade the power of your main weapon, your sub-weapon, and your energy gauge. The on-screen bars never grow any larger, unfortunately, but the more you power up your energy, the faster it will fill and the more shots you can fire before it empties. But keep in mind that when you upgrade your weapons, they use more energy, so you really need to keep your energy level up. Still, if you grind a bit, you'll become pretty damned powerful, and you'll be able to walk right through enemies that took you quite a while to kill before. I guess it's a good thing I don't really mind grinding. It's really not that bad here. There are some boss fights that might take you a few tries no matter how much you've grinded beforehand. Naturally, your new abilities will allow you to access areas you couldn't get to before. The game has a map that autofills, just like Metroid. Well, Super Metroid, anyway. Granted, the world that you explore here isn't huge by any means. You can't go in expecting a game the size of Super Metroid. I'm guessing that the game took me about three and a half hours to be. I didn't fill in every square of the map, so let's say four hours or so if you really want to find everything. This is another one that only has one save slot. This game was ported from Kai Magazine's MSX2 game from 2017, and they added scrolling and other modern amenities like that. The graphics here are mostly fairly good, though certainly not amazing. All levels have at least some parallax, and nothing looks ugly. In fact, I quite like the detail in some of the metal backgrounds. The animation is generally pretty nice, and nothing seems stiff. The sound and music is mostly ambient, and it does a good job at that. The game doesn't have a sound test, and you won't miss it, as nothing here lends itself to listening to outside of the game. Life on Mars Reimagined comes in a nice plastic clamshell case. It's available on cartridge only, there's no ROM to download. The artwork is reversible. Inside, you have a curiously skinny instruction manual that's in color. Then you have some cars that are wrapped in plastic. The cartridge feels good, and the PCB is beveled. Overall, I really like this game, but it is a bit short. 
you might be upset if you paid the equivalent of 80 US dollars after shipping for such a brief experience. But for an indie title on a 35 year old console, I quite like it and I personally don't regret it at all. In 2023, Kai Magazine followed up with Life on Earth Reimagined. This was also adapted from an earlier MSX2 game. This one also plays as a single player run and gun, but it's an arcade focused title rather than a Metroidvania light. Basically, you're trying to save humanity, presumably from the same virus that infected the people in Life on Mars. You can run, jump, and shoot in seven directions. The one direction you can't shoot is directly down. If you want to shoot diagonally up left or right, then you must move while you're shooting. There's no way to lock yourself in place. You also have a melee move for close-up attacks, which is assigned to its own button. I'm not sure I understand this. You can only use it to attack enemies close up, but when you're that close to an enemy, this happens automatically anyway, so what's the point of assigning it to a button? You can do a downward kick by jumping and then pressing one of the downward directions and pressing jump again in midair. And you can run by double tapping left or right. If you use a six button controller, the extra buttons can cycle through any of the weapons that you collected, but the start button also does this. You have to hold down the start button to pause the game, which is kind of weird. If the melee button could have been used for cycling weapons, then the start button could have been used normally. This game employs one of the cheapest mechanics in platform gaming, and that's the dreaded bounce back when you're hit. Haha, <laughs> yeah, who doesn't love that? It can often be tough to tell what can hurt you, like in this level, which has tons of things zipping by in the background, which blend in with the enemy projectiles. There are lots of bottomless pits for you to bounce back into when you get hit. Oh yeah, I'm having fun. Wait, did that even touch me? No, it didn't, what the hell? The enemies also like to shoot at you from off the screen. That's awesome. Just kidding, it's not. You can't take a ton of hits before you die. I think maybe if the main character were wearing something more than the skimpiest of outfits, she might be able to take some more damage. This auto-scrolling stage is absolutely ridiculous. The game's controls are not adequate for this at all. One mistake and you're done, and you must constantly double tap to run, so make sure your thumbs are nimble. The developers hate you. Still, it can be done, I was able to do it three different times. And why do I sometimes fall through these air cars in the part after that? I'm not pressing down and jump, I literally just fall through them. Why? It's so dumb. I'm guessing the coding is just bad. This is one of those games where the designers knew the game inside and out as they designed it and they tried to make it challenging for them. This is never a good approach if you want to make a balanced game that appeals to as many customers as possible. Fortunately, you can try as many times as you'd like and the game saves your progress, which is great, but it only saves after you defeat a boss. So if you turn off the game after a game over on this stage, you come back to this stage the next time you play it. I did try this one several different times over the course of two months just to make sure I wasn't having a bad day or something, but I came away with the same opinion each time. Hmm, maybe I can try using a game genie and some cheat codes. Ooh, denied. This one also has only one save slot. Graphically, this one's also a mixed bag. There is a lot of super nice parallax scrolling to enjoy. It looks really good. And the first boss looks super cool. Is he an AT-AT or is he an ED-209? Or is he the boss from the first side-scrolling stage in Axley? I like the use of the shadow and highlight functions throughout, like here where they create an appearance of transparent lights in this level. However, there's not much detail or color in many of the backgrounds, especially after the first couple of stages. There's also not a ton of variety in the graphics. Many, if not most of the sprites from Life on Mars make a reappearance here, which is understandable since it's basically the same universe. The main character is, well, she's certainly something. She also looks weird when she shoots up. She just points the gun up, but keeps looking straight ahead. The music in this one though is fantastic. It was done by Savage Regime, who you'll remember from Xenocrisis and Astabros. They make you beat the game on hard to unlock the sound test. Damn, yeah, that's not happening. The entire opening story features a voiceover, which is really cool for a cartridge game. The staff was infected, and after a few days of quarantine, the infected showed superhuman strength and uncontrollable rage. The physical product is much like Life on Mars was with the box, reversible artwork, and beveled cartridge PCB. 
However, the instruction manual for this one is full-sized instead of skinny, which is good. It's available physically only. Unfortunately, as a game, this one is a letdown for me after Life on Mars. I personally wouldn't recommend paying nearly $80 on this unless you don't mind an unpolished game. The music is the only thing that made me play it as much as I did. I wish I could at least enjoy the sound test on my Genesis, but if I want to listen to the music, I have to do it on YouTube. Okay, I lied, I have an extra game for you. This is a preview of Vengeance Hunters, which is coming to the Neo Geo from Nalua Studio. This is beat em up and it has some huge characters. It's a two player game of course, and you can choose among three different fighters. You're beating up lots of undead enemies and even several that are still quite alive. What's pretty cool about this one is that when you use a special attack, you lose part of your life bar like most beat em ups. But here, if you can manage not to get attacked, it slowly refills and it refills even faster as you attack enemies. As it stands now, the gameplay generally feels pretty solid and it makes constant use of all four buttons. I first played as this guy who is supposedly a bit harder to use. There's also a giant robot which is fun and pretty easy to learn, and the girl Candy who is pretty flashy with some of her crazy moves. Naturally, everything here is gigantic because hey, it's the Neo Geo, but I haven't seen any scaling effects anywhere. The music is fantastic and it makes great use of the Neo's FM capabilities in addition to its PCM channels. Now Lua Studio says that they're hoping for a May release, but you know how these things go, so we'll see. It's going to be on a physical Neo Geo cartridge and they say it will also be released on modern platforms. And maybe later an encrypted ROM for the Neo SD for people who don't want to spend a ton on an actual cartridge. I'm really looking forward to seeing how this one turns out when it's finished. And there you go, a bunch of new games for old consoles and even a preview of an upcoming one. So have you played any of these? And if so, what did you think? Are my opinions hot garbage or maybe yours are? There are a lot more games coming out in the future as well. It's definitely an exciting time to be a fan of these old platforms, don't you think? Anyway, thank you for watching GameSack. The SG-1000, the Master System, the Genesis, the freaking Game Gear, the Sega CD, the 32X, the Saturn, the Pico, Dreamcast. Sega has tons of phenomenal game systems, but which is the best? Sega Pods! That's right, Pods from Sega is the ultimate futuristic game of light and sound. Lights flash and you wave your hand in the order of the flashing. Loud, totally not annoying sound effects remind you that you're having fun! Sega, Sega, Sega! Pods, Pods, Pods. Sega Pods, because everything else is a stupid piece of crap, stupid piece of crap that could go straight to hell. Available at your favorite retailer.